Welcome to the main top mill, where my daughter Erin and I basically have created a custom making worsted top making mill and blending mill for fiber artists who want to have custom tops and yarns made. Uh, the daughter Erin is our quality control uh, person. She makes sure to uh, design and prove out the various blends that we make and the percentages uh, it within the blends. And what we use to do this is either our domestic Rambouillet top that we make in-house or tops that come from AAA uh, top making mills, um, the majority of which um, are Italian. And what we use is worsted top making processing. And before we talk about the secrets of how we, how we do what we do, uh, we need to go over some basic um, information about what is the worsted process and where does it come from. Now the worsted process um, actually can be dated back to um, the 13th century, uh, but everything was basically a hand process at that point. Um, King Edward was um, trying to um, solidify England as a premier processor and producer of fine wools, and especially for tapestries, because that was basically you know, the number one uh, woven product um, of the time. So what they did, um, that we centered a commission in the town of Worsted, England, which then became known as Worsted, and then that became the Worsted Process. Now, what Worsted Processing is, the goal of it, is to produce fibers that are all parallel in a continuous coil so that once they are spun, you can spin the fibers extremely fine into extremely fine yarn and they will be strong and long lasting. And this is achieved because in this processing path, the fibers themselves, even though they might have curvature, which is the springiness, they might have cohesion, which is the ability to hold together, and they might have loft, which is a nice and lovely bouncy field, feel, um, some fibers just do not have those type of capabilities. So, you know, in the time of Edward, King Edward, um, they were really concentrating on the industry of making tapestries and tapestry fabrics um, with uh, the Flemish weavers. So, they basically were looking at how to, you know, you know qualify um, the processing path and make sure that they were making a very high quality product where all the fibers were parallel so that, you know, they would be long lasting and even. And in the hand processing of, you know, of top, into top making, you use combs. You know, these combs are used in a motion like this. The t machinery that was developed for Worcester processing back during the in Industrial Revolution, um, a lot of that uh, machine, those machines had to be, or had to use the expertise of both, or not both, of the, the breeder of the sheep, the uh, chemists, uh, mechanical uh, machine designers, uh, physicists, um, and others to, in order to determine how the fibers would flow through the machinery so that they could be processed. And why that is important to recognize is that fibers themselves um, have both um, depending upon whether they are a protein or a man-made fiber, 
Um, some of them have positive charges, some of them have negative charges. Um, and the structures of the fibers, especially wools, um, can be very different. Now, in this picture here, we have different fibers and different fiber structures. And in those fiber structures, uh, we can see that the coarse wool um, and fine wool have different types of scale height. The alpaca fiber has a different type of scale height. The next fiber is cashmere, uh, which is more jagged and uneven and can actually have little raised lips to it. Then you start looking at silk and linen and polyester fibers. And they all have, again, different types of structure. So when you talk about building a mechanical device for that, um, you have to take into consideration that the fibers have to go be presented, which is called infeed, uh, into the machines and how they are going to flow so that they remain, remain uh, in an even type of plane as they go through the process. Uh, and the early mechanical engineers, they did the, this with you know, various gears um, and belts and uh, basically changing the size and diameters of the various gears and belt locations. They were able to basically produce uh, different types of tops uh, from different types of fiber. And why that's significant to, uh, to look at, to remember, is that a lot of people think that uh, the Worcester process is, quote unquote, only good for long staple length fibers. And that the woolen process is only good for short staple length fibers. So my question to you is, what about comb cotton? Now, comb cotton, cotton is a short staple length fiber, but Obviously, someone developed um, cotton combing machines, and during the Industrial Revolution, they did that. And the various different types of combs that were first developed in the late 1800s, uh, or in the 1800s, were basically the Lister comb and the Noble comb. And then later on, um, the combing machines that were developed by the French were the rectilinear comb. So in this picture, we have a picture of a noble comb. And then we have below that the blue picture. That's the a rectilinear comb. Um, in the corner, opposite corner to this corner here, kind of shows you um, the diagram of how that, lister, that noble comb processed the fibers through it. And the, the thing that's significant is that as the fiber came in here, they're held uh, how to do this in reverse. They're held right there. By, it, by what's called a sword to create a beard of fiber and that they then get pulled across okay, sorry pulled across to be brushed by the by the um, circular comb of the top making machine and the, this di this picture here is a picture of a system of, of um, rotary combs called the vario system it's a series of different um, strips of, of wire that form a different pattern, um, the way that they're laid out for different types of fibers that would be processed through them. So not one, not one um, vario system is good for all types of fibers. Now, in our particular mill, um, our comb, our, our rotary comb, um, card, and and pin draft, pin drafters are pretty much set up 
to process fibers from 11 microns to uh, 21 uh, microns. Um, my, uh, human hair is, is approximately 100 microns. So when we talk about um, the other types of processing paths, which are the woolen processing path and the semi-worsted path, um, not discounting the hand, you know, hand processing, but when you have woolen, you're basically dealing with short staple length fibers, and you're basically making a specific, particular type of yarn that over the course of time is not as strong as a worsted yarn and is not spun as fine. The semi-worsted is a, a process which you basically are coming off of your, your card, carding machine, and the carding machine um, has a different type of clothing, which is the types of wires and pins, etc., on the different drums that the fiber gets processed through. Um, and the goal is, is not quite the same as the goal in a worsted card. As a worsted card, the goal is to begin the paralyzing process, as well as getting rid of the gross amount of um, debris and VM and other bits uh, from the fiber and produce it into a, into a coil, a carded sliver, that um, is pretty much um, prepared for making it parallel. It then goes from the worsted card to a series of pin drafting steps. And the reason why it goes through different pin drafting steps is because when the fibers, uh, the card sliver comes off the card, um, there are hooks because all the drums um, on the card and the way that the fibers are taken on and off of the main drum by the workers and strippers. Yes, there are some very strange nomenclature to uh, the card, as in all things textile. Um, so those hooks um, basically mean that the fibers, when they get presented to the pin drafter, or if you're going to go through the semi-worsted or woolen process, those fibers are not straight, and each end has a, a hook on them, which in time, you know, does not help the fibers stay together well for a yarn. So what the first step of the pin drafter is, and the pin drafter has a series of uh, full faller bars, and a faller bar basically looks like a, you know, hair comb. And there's two different styles of um, faller bars. One has more of a conical shape. That's for basically first pass. That's for you know, opening and helping uh, more to um, hold back fibers that because the um, card sliver is really still more ununiform in parallel nature than it will become. And then and these folder bars, there are basically 72 in a pin drafter. There's 36 on top, 36 on the bottom. And the pin drafter basically um, allows the fibers to pass through and holds back fiber to, that goes through these folder bars that become more parallel. And as it gets delivered, one of the hooks is removed. So what happens then, it goes back through the, the pin drafter, the folder bars are changed, or you have another set of folder bars, um, another uh, pin drafter, which are round pins, and they have a slightly different spacing. Now, all folder bars can have many different types of spacing, and of course, just like the various clothing for um, the card drums and the, uh, the comb, uh, they can be, have different wires sets for different ranges of microns. But after we go through the process of um, 
pin drafting three times, event, the fibers then go to the rectilinear comb. Now, the comb, the color that's kind of like an orange is light beige orange, um, that is the fibers come in to that, that arm that comes down that just bisects the blue, uh, that's the uh, sword, and just outside the sword, um, the, a beard of fiber um, is presented, and that little bit that, that's touching that, that sword from the blue is the draw off, and that draw off draws off individual fibers from that, er, um, from that beard, and below that, um, in the, just in the green, there's a looks like a round drum. That's the rect, that's the rectilinear combs um, combing um, brush, or in our case, the Vario system. Below that is a a brush that brushes off all the debris, and below that is a doffer that pulls off all that debris and creates noil, which is a waste product from top making, which can be used for um, upholstery, for doll making, and other forms of stuffing. Uh, so that is kind of what the machine looks like. Now in the commercial world, this is what a commercial carding and combing operation looks like. You have your cards, then you have pin drafters, and then you have third final pin drafter before it goes to the combs, and then it goes to two more pin drafters to finish it into top. Now, one of the reasons why you have um, so many pin drafters involved is that a pin drafter um, basically reduces the size of whatever the weight of fiber going into it is. So let's say for gross purposes, a pin drafter has a normal draft that produces, releases 25% of the weight of what goes into it. So you're basically putting in, you have to calculate, you know, how much fiber that you need to put into it to get a specific amount at the end. Now, what is going on during this in the, in the machine itself is that this is process is called doubling. Now, please, you know, let's recall that te uh, textile nomenclature, you know, can be a little bit funny. Uh, the doubling actually is the reduction of the and the delivered sliver from the input slivers. So when we do this processing, and this is why when we look at the commercial setup, you happen to see that the setup has two cards feeding the initial pin drafter that then feeds the next pin drafter. Then the finishing pin drafters before going to the combing machines does the final pass, and then it goes to the combing machines, and then it goes back to two more sets of pin drafting. Now, what is go the reason behind that is that in the commercial processing world, the goal is to produce as many pounds as possible at a time. So, under high production rates, the producers of commercial top are not that interested um, in retaining the fiber characteristics of the fibers in the blend. This is where what we do is a lot different and this is how we've modified our particular machines is to preserve the fiber characteristics in the blend. Now, one of the, the, diff, the results is commercially made merino top kind of looks like this. 
it has you know a nice little bounce and elasticity but when we're working with it it's very hard to work with it's hard to divide it's it's basically been what we call overdrafted and in some cases um, depending upon the mill you can actually see draft waves um, in the in the uh, the sliver itself and that's basically caused by as the fibers because they have this elasticity um, in in the merino wool that there are times where as the rotation of the machine goes around and around of the drums and everything this stops there's a stop and there's a pull there's a stop and a pull and a stop and a pull and even under extremely high tension and under extreme high tension which these machines operate under production loads once it comes off that machine the fibers relax but the effects of that overdrafting are then seen now when we look at the 18 and a half micro merino same product that we that we reprocess you see it has a lot more elasticity still has good cohesion but it's easy to divide and it basically self drafts now that's very very important uh, when we're trying to produce extremely high quality luxury yarns or high performance yarns because when we want to get the fibers all evenly distributed and married together or as my daughter Erin says they play well together um, you want them to be able to hold up and be very you know long and have uh, have a very long life and perform well now flax is a really wonderful fiber um, its top And this is the cellulose fiber its top as you can see as I basically kind of like self draft gently draft it it basically wants to go uh, this is technically what we call a hard fiber it's a fiber that goes through the machines faster and we're going to back up here remember I said that when they first develop these um, machines for commercial processing during the Industrial Revolution, uh, there were chemists and physicists and mathematicians involved in the design concepts and the implementations of the machines. Because, as you saw with it, the flax, if I put very little pressure on it, I begin to, to pull it outside of its coil or outside of its web. So if that goes through the machine versus wool which has let's say a lot of curvature uh, and a lot of resistance like I showed you in the merino uh, that fiber as it gets drawn through the machine is going to want to hold and grab each other much better than the flax which doesn't really want to so that is something that we, we look at when we um, want to process top now, in top making, part of the other problem, probably the other challenge is, is that underneath this this machine, and you know, as you can see, in this picture, this is a new error, that we call an error combing machine. This is the latest generation of rectilinear combs, and you can see that it has a lot of feeds. Our feed, our comber has 24 feeds that go into it. And why that is significant is that in order to deal with the reality that every time fiber goes through any of these machines and it goes through pin drafters, the size of that sliver is reduced, becomes smaller and smaller. So with the combing machine, since what goes into the machine we kind of want it to produce a 45 to 65 gram or 80 gram per meter sliver at the end. Um, that's not 
doable when you only put in, you know, 20 grams or 40 grams of infeed. It just doesn't work. So our comb basically has 24 feeds. And based on you know, our calculations, when we deal just with the Rambouillet wool, we need to put in 24 feeds at 18 grams per meter to go through our combing machine to come out with a comb sliver that we can then put into finished top and produce only, only an 18 gram per meter at best sliver. And that all has to do with how the machines operate, how the draft affects the, it's not doubling, it's the reduction of the mass of fibers that are delivered. So that's, again, really important. Uh, so when we look at fibers themselves, you know, some of the challenges in fiber um, is that when we get lots of wool, we go to a wool warehouse. Um, the wool warehouse or sheep shed, they have classers and the, of the fibers. They determine what the micron is. They determine the cleanliness of it, the amount of lanolin. And there's other specifications that go into that. That lot of fiber, let's say it's a 2,000 pounds of fiber, uh, we then have a core test made. And a core test of the wool is a destructive test and is approximately 15 to 60 pounds um, of fiber that will be destroyed during the process. So very, very small lots, the amount of, there's just, they're not big enough lots to actually give enough of a sample of what's going to happen. Now, the difference between um, wool and alpaca fiber. Uh, this is a this is a histogram uh, from a an alpaca, and you can see the bell-shaped curve on the bottom. It's fairly broad and fairly spread out, and that's a de determination that shows you that it's not a very uniform um, bunch of fiber on that critter. And, you know, when we look at the bands that are kind of like in the middle there, those top three and a little bit of the ones to either side are what actually a rectilinear comb gives you back. Everything else in that diagram is waste, which is not good because you have to clean these machines manually and in the case of the doffer, on your back with an X-Acto knife, and it can take over two and a half to three hours um, to do to clean the doffer. The other thing that happens is that depending upon the fiber, the health of the fiber, as you can see in the lower here, you can have different f fiber shapes. You can have breaks in the fiber, um, and you know in a core test, the destructive test is called length and strength test which tells us the, per the percentage of, of where the breaks are going to be and helps us determine uh, the yield, the estimated yields in combing um, of those fibers. So when we approach some, a wool or any fiber that has a 50% yield, um, no top maker is very, very happy unless the labor is just so cheap that it doesn't matter how much time it takes to clean out the machines. So there's a definite, you know, relationship to fiber that does not is not qualified for worsted processing. It's not qualified to meet the minimum requirements for court for a core test to make sure that it can be processed. And you know, the goal overall in the worsted process is to give the fiber artist and the yarn maker and, the, and basically the yarns themselves, all the fibers that parallel, in parallel, so when they are twisted, they don't have to be over-twisted to compensate for weakness and voids in the fiber. 
so that the fibers will line up and marry together so we can make very, very fine garments, you know, fine suiting fabrics. Um, or not. We don't have to necessarily make a suiting fabric out of a worsted top, but a worsted top blended with other fibers can produce some very, very exciting um, possibilities. And the building blocks, the Lego blocks, that could, you know, that, that could go on top of each other of these fibers, you have to, you're looking at, you know, the scale height. What is the scale height of the fiber, and how it's how it's going to survive? You know, where where it's going to possibly break, and you overall are evaluating, you know, what the machines will allow you to have as an output. So. First and foremost, um, worsted processing is a process which requires enough fiber. You know, bare real bare minimum is you know is around 60, 6, 600 pounds to make a, a good enough top to be able to be made into a really wonderful, um, for, for very amazing yarns. So, now we talked about the machines. We talked about worsted processing. The next part of this puzzle is when we talk, when the machines look at the fibers. They do not, they are not able to discern if the fibers have high curvature, low curvature, no curvature. They just don't know. And up until about three or four years ago, uh, the Woolmark people, W-O-O-L-M-A-R-K, uh, Woolmark.com in uh, Australia, have a tremendously wonderful uh, website. They have a whole description on the various processing paths that exist. Uh, they did not believe um, the of, that curvature was important, uh, basically because the goal, you know, at that point of the machines was producing as many thousands of pounds at a time. And producing thousands of pounds at a time, um, you know, is something where you don't want to be spending a lot of time, labor on. So they're basically running the machines at max production rates without any regard for the nature of those fibers, what's in the fibers themselves, their curvature, their cohesion, elasticity, or anything. And, you know, this gets further complicated when you do not take those things into account and you try and blend a top that is made in the commercial goal of mass production like this when you're doing blending. Because this requires, before I even blend it, blend with it, I have to reprocess this to open it up to bring back its fiber characteristics. So if I wanted to, you know, want to make really exquisite yarns or tops or felts or whatever in that regard, I would more want to work with something that's made in the worsted process because as I gain knowledge in, in what the fiber characteristics and what the fiber characteristics of blends when you put things together, um, you then have a greater you know, understanding to create a predictable model for how your yarn and your end products are actually going to perform. Um, 